Let's get into a division that I am very familiar with in the NFC West here. And we're talking Seattle Seahawks today on Peacock and Williamson with our esteemed colleague and guest Corbin Smith of Locked On Seahawks. We talk frequently throughout the season doing crossover episodes, but this is the national show. So let's talk about where the Seahawks fit in here in not only the entire NFC West, but the NFC at large and the NFL. It's an interesting team. There's holdouts. There is big trades this offseason. What is the outlook for the Seattle Seahawks in 2022? Coming up right now. You're listening to the Peacock and Williamson NFL Show, your daily podcast on the National Football League, powered by the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome to the Peacock and Williamson NFL show. Brian Peacock and Matt Williamson here with you as always at BD Peacock at Williamson NFL on Twitter, but a very special guest today. We're talking Seattle Seahawks with Corbin Smith at Corbin Smith NFL. You can read his work on SI and of course, every day here on the network hosting locked on Seahawks with Rob ring, who we uh, enjoy ch- chatting with as well here on the show. But Corbin, we got to talk to you first of all about uh, some of the latest going on with the Seahawks. And uh, it's been no shortage of storylines in Seattle this off season. Obviously the trade we'll get to, but with many camps last week and DK Metcalf not showing up, um, it sends a signal that the Seattle Seahawks expect to win, right? Because if you're trading away your star quarterback, it would make sense to, if you're rebuilding, send away someone who could bring you back a ton of draft capital and, and something that someone you wouldn't have to spend a ton of money to resign yourselves and DK Metcalf. So this, this sort of retool, not rebuild right now going on Seattle, going on in Seattle is very fascinating, which I guess you shouldn't not expect that Pete Carroll at his advanced stage wants to still win, but it's harder to do that without a, a franchise quarterback. So um, there's a ton of angles to that, but first let's just focus on the guy who was not at, minicamp in DK Metcalf and that holdout right now. What's going on with DK? You know, I find the entire situation bizarre because normally when a player holds out like this from a minicamp, they haven't showed up for other stuff during offseason workouts too. And yet DK Metcalf was here on April 18th when Seattle opened its offseason program. So I don't know if it was just a change of advisement there, or maybe it's a sign that the negotiations have not progressed the way that he thought they were going to up to this point, or it could just be a simple case where I'm rehabbing from a foot injury. I wasn't going to be able to participate anyway. So I'll make a little bit of a statement here when I was not going to be able to practice in these game, in these uh, events anyway. So I don't think the panic meter is very high right now because this is the time of year where John Schneider really gets to work with these negotiations and, A lot of the extensions they sign with big-time players happen in July, early August. We saw it with Jamal Adams last year, first week of training camp. So fans, I don't think, should be getting bent out of shape about this yet. But if we get to training camp and he's not there and there hasn't been any movement, then that panic meter starts to escalate quite a bit since they chose not to move him when there were certainly some teams that were interested in acquiring him and maybe sending over a first round pick and maybe additional picks on top of that. So Corbin BP mentioned, you know, the, the retooling, not rebuilding, certainly not going to tank. And I am not a believer in tanking at all in the NFL to believe, to be honest, but you look at the Patriots, the Steelers, the Saints, some of these teams that have been really, really competitive and Seattle absolutely applies I just think this team's in a lot worse shape than them. You know, like sometimes I think you got to know when to hold them and when to fold them. And I feel like they're still kind of holding their cards, even though they got a two and a six in their hand, you know? Yeah, it's certainly, I think it's an interesting case study to look Mm -hmm. at here because they do have a lot of pieces on both sides of the football still. I, you know, you can make debates about Jamal Adams, what they gave up for him. But Pretty Jamal good Adams player. is still a very, very good safety. Quandre mm-hmm. Diggs is one of the most underrated safeties in football. They re-signed him. Jordan Brooks, I believe, is an all-pro in waiting. Hmm. The decision to move on from Bobby Wagner, I think, was much more understandable than obviously the Russell Wilson trade, which still has got some people baffled. But Jordan Brooks is ready to step into that role. They've got a couple young guys up front, pass rushers, Daryl Taylor and second-round pick Boye Mafe, who they're really excited about. 
their defensive line in the interior was one of the better ones in the NFL last year, and they brought all those guys back for the most part. So the defense has pieces. They've got intriguing guys at all three levels. On offense, with DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, I think Noah Fant is going to be a lot of fun in this offense Mm -hmm. with Shane Waldron as the coordinator. They've got two young tackles that they really like that are probably going to be thrown into the fire right away for better or worse. I mean, there is a lot of talent on both sides of the ball, but it all goes back to the quarterback position. And if you've got the 32nd best quarterback situation in the league, which you can really make a strong argument Seattle is in that mix, it doesn't matter necessarily what talent that you have elsewhere. And so that's why this is such a fascinating case study. If the quarterback position ends up panning out to be average with the other players they've got, then maybe this team is pesky and they surprise some people with the number of games they win. You know Pete Carroll's not going to be tanking, but that quarterback situation really looms over everything else with this roster. Yeah, and, you know, Pete Carroll, they've talked about, you know, maybe it was because of the draft grade and, and Pete Carroll's comments about how, Drew Lock would have been the the top pick in this year's draft, which I think you know most people would probably disagree with. Um, but from my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, from these spring workouts and practices and mini camps, it sounds like maybe Geno Smith is actually ahead of Drew Lock to be the starter this year. Yeah, Geno Smith right now would be the starter if the Seahawks had a game tomorrow because he knows the offense. And I, I will say this: I think Drew Lock has closed the gap over the last couple of weeks, as much as you can during OTAs and minicamp. He's really picked up the offense quickly. You can see the rapport he's developing with the tight ends. And Will Disley, I mean, obviously he's played with Noah Fan, but he and Will Disley look like they've got a pretty darn good connection already going. And a few of the receivers, Tyler Lockett has had some nice catches from Lock. The two of them seem like they're hitting it off fairly well. So I expect that this is going to be a true 50-50 battle going into training camp where they're going to be splitting up reps and – it's going to boil down to who doesn't turn over the football and who can facilitate the ball to the playmakers that the Seahawks have, because they certainly have the playmakers on the outside. The quarterbacks got to be the point guard like Pete Carroll wants them to be. Whoever can play that point guard role is going to win it. But right now I would say Geno Smith is certainly out in front. I do think Drew Locke has closed that gap some, though. Geno Smith is certainly more point guard than Drew Locke. I mean, Drew Locke is – half court, you know, Hail Marys to me, you know, I mean, not a this ball distributor the way you want, but I still think he deserves a, a chance to compete, of course. And I do think Geno Smith is a better quarterback than probably given credit for and has had a pretty good career all in all. That being said, though, I mean, Corbin, do you agree if Jimmy or Baker becomes available for next to nothing that Seattle should just jump all over them? Oh, absolutely. If either one of those players gets cut, I think John Schneider is going to be jumping for the chance. He's just not going to give up a draft pick, and he's not going to eat the salary for either one of those players either. And why would he? I mean, really, there's no competition unless Carolina is going to throw their hat in the ring. You'd be auctioning against Mm -hmm. yourself. So if one of those guys gets cut, I absolutely expect John Schneider to go take care of that and sign that player. But they're not going to go trade for one of those guys you know, if one of them was truly an elite quarterback, it'd be different. But right, right, right. There's really no point in trading assets away right now. You don't I mean, want to give up future, you know, assets for a stopgap guy. Exactly. Yeah. But both of them would be, I would say that Jimmy Garoppolo would probably be a slight upgrade. And then I would say Baker Mayfield. This is just my opinion. I think Mayfield has a higher ceiling of those two players. So I would say that he'd probably be the one of the two that, in my opinion, I would prefer if you were going to go sure. that route. But either one of them, if they hit the market as free agents, John Schneider is going to pounce. There's no question about it. And it conceivably, Baker could be a long-term answer or, you know, two, three-year answer where I'm not sure Jimmy could be, you know. Yeah, exactly. That's part of my rationale behind that. And Baker could be a longer-term answer than Geno Smith or uh, right. Drew Locke as well. And yeah, I've always felt like Baker was a perfect fit. And I think even personality-wise, maybe that could work better with Baker Mayfield and and Pete Carroll for some reason. And maybe I'm wrong on that. Just, you know, the ex-college guy. You know I, Pete loves those players that have yeah. chips on their shoulder. And Baker oh, Mayfield, yeah. for better or worse, has got a boulder on his shoulder. <laughs> right, and you know right. now it's even bigger with what's going on in Cleveland. They so fit in well. I, I agree with the idea of not trading for him. I understand why Seattle has not jumped to do that. But yeah. if he becomes a free agent, absolutely they should go get him. At least throw his hat in the ring 
with the other two guys they've got. Because Jacob Eason is a very distant third. He is not part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and so an essentially free Baker Mayfield with how much talent he still has, you know, with a chip on his shoulder going into a contract year, he'll be playing for his next deal and maybe his NFL future as a starter. I mean, I, you could get a ton of value out of that if you're the Seattle Seahawks. So it makes perfect sense to me. Uh, when it comes to quarterbacks, uh, last bit on quarterbacks here, when it comes to the draft, I thought there's two interesting notes with the Seahawks. One was, and of course, they don't have the pick if it's not for trading away Russell Wilson. But do you think Russell Wilson looked at the Charles Cross pick and was like, oh, what the hell? Now you guys go right. and get this like, <laughs> star left tackle now that I'm out of town? You know, he might have he might have reacted that way, but then he's got to understand, well, we've never been in a position to be able to get a guy like that in the top 10 because they've consistently been in contention. And then it's last year, they would have had a number 10 pick, but the Jamal Adams trade. So, yeah, I, I could see him batting an eye about that. But, I mean, when you consider the salary he was bringing in, the fact they weren't having top picks in the first round, I mean, they haven't had an opportunity to get a player with the upside that Charles Cross brings at the tackle position. So it's just one of those things is really difficult to have both. And on the, uh, the, the second part of that is you go even deeper. Now in the third round, they draft another tackle, more of a, you know, a raw projection in Abraham Lucas. Uh, are you surprised that they went Lucas and didn't go for one of the quarterbacks that was slipping into the third round there? I was surprised they didn't go quarterback at that point when somebody like Malik Willis was still available in the third round. I thought that might be the hot spot. And, and I know for a fact that they liked Sam Howell. That is the other quarterback that I was told way back in the combine that they really liked. And I think they would have taken him in the fifth round if he fell a couple more spots. I think that that was a sweet spot for them. They just didn't want to force the issue this year. A quarterback. They didn't feel like with the other needs they have on their roster and with there not being a guy that they viewed as an elite signal caller in this class, they just felt like, you know what, you know, for example, Tariq Woolen in the fifth round, and we're going to get him. We're going to bring in a guy that's got an incredibly high ceiling at another position of need, and we can find our way at quarterback down the line. If the right guy is there with our next pick, then we'll take him. And it just didn't, just didn't match up with their draft plan. But I was not surprised about Lucas, however. They went into this draft with three tackles on their roster and a combined 14 games between them. They absolutely had to load up at that position. And Lucas, I think, really fits this scheme well. Both these guys do. They want athletic tackles in Waldron's offense. So doubling up is something I actually mocked a couple of times. It made a lot of sense. More with Corbin yep. Smith coming up. We got to talk a little bit more about this running game and a little bit of a fantasy perspective as well with the running back situation in Seattle and a conversation you had with one of their current running backs and Chris Carson's rehab and, and what the rest of his career might look like for the Seattle Seahawks. And of course, where the Seattle Seahawks are in the NFC West coming up. But we got to let the folks out there know about Blue Nile. If you are shopping for that special someone in your life, BlueNile.com can help. You can celebrate all of life's special moments from, from creating the custom engagement ring of her dreams to gifting a classic and timeless jewelry piece, all at prices you won't find at a traditional jeweler. And at bet on at, 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 um, at blue Nile.com, uh, you can get all the help you need to find the exact jewelry piece you need for that special someone, whether it's for mom or you're taking your relationship to the next level, the modern convenience of shopping online at blue Nile. But the best part is the help you can get to find that piece. Available 24-7 jewelry experts at Blue Nile via phone or chat to help you find the perfect and memorable gift of her lifetime at any budget. So make your moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com and Locked On Sports listeners will get $50 off purchases of $500 or more. This is a Locked On podcast exclusive that includes engagement as well. So you're going to want to use code locked on that is promo code locked on plus every order is insured ships free and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside shop stress-free and find your forever peace go to blue nile.com today i want to thank everybody again for making peacock and williamson your first listen for your second listen check out the ultimate nba mock draft starting this week over 50 insiders nothing equals the ultimate nba mock draft and if you've tuned into the ultimate nfl mock draft which matt williamson and i and everybody on the network is involved with then you know how awesome of a project this is and it is time for the ultimate nba mock draft to start this week first pick is june 16th search ultimate nba mock draft and follow 
now so you don't miss a single pick for your team. All right, Corbin. Who is the running back to own in fantasy football? Because Matt and I uh, recorded a podcast for when Matt is on vacation. It's going to drop later. Actually, I believe it's going to drop tomorrow. And we were talking about, you know, kind of had a little fantasy war room. Which running backs do we like? And I just feel like the the league winning type of draft pick is someone who's projected as a number two running back, but has all the talent to be a, an RB one in the NFL. And for a team that's probably going to run the ball a whole lot, I feel like rookie Ken Walker is, is that type of a player, but Rashad Penny's kind of in his way. And then, uh, you know, Chris Carson might also be in his way if he's healthy. So we, we've got to hash this whole thing out with the, with the guy who knows the most about this roster. First of all, Chris Carson, is he going to be a factor or is this a, an injury that might end his career? And I know you've talked to him recently, so you have some firsthand knowledge of the situation. Yeah, I talked to Chris last week about this situation. He's certainly not thinking about the end of his career right now. He is taking every day, one day at a time. And it sounds like he's very close to being where they could clear him. And Pete Carroll even said that. So I, I still view this as a 50-50 proposition. There's an image floating around that a doctor uh, put out there on Twitter that showed what operation he had having neck fusion. And everybody's like, oh, my God, this guy shouldn't be playing. And you can make that argument. But based on what I've been told, the people I've talked to, including the player himself, uh, nobody's ruling anything out at this point. He's got a big checkup coming up in less than two weeks now in Dallas. And I think that's where his fate's going to be determined. If he's cleared then – then he's probably out there for training camp and he's been doing all the other stuff off the field as far as training goes. But uh, this is certainly a dicey situation when you're talking about a neck injury with a running back. So that is truly a 50 50 thing that I think is very much up in the air, even with the past tense verbiage that Pete Carroll was using last week. I, I think that this is still a door that is open for Carson might not be open a ton, but he could still be back as far as fantasy value though, for, for this position, I'm actually going to say Rashad Penny should be your go-to. Mm. Uh, Ken Walker the third has a chance to have a really good rookie season because they're going to run the ball a lot, and he could be, you know, it could be one A and two A type thing. But Rashad Penny really found himself late last season, and looking at him in OTAs and minicamp, he looks like he's in outstanding shape. And there's some people that are batting an eye when he said he was weighing around 235, but that's where he was the end of last year. This guy is running in the four fours at 235. The talent has never been the issue. It's just a couple bad injuries. The ACL was the big one, and he had some soft tissue injuries after that, which is normal. Guys have that happen after ACL injuries. So while he's missed a lot of games, they've at least now got a baseline to know what this guy can do. I mean, the last five games last season, just flat out ridiculous. Eight runs of 25 or more yards, which tied Jonathan Taylor for the NFL lead for the entire season. And he did it on more than 200 fewer carries. There's not a running back in the NFL that is more explosive than what Rashad Penny is. He proved it last year. He just has to stay healthy. So there's risk, obviously, drafting him. But I think this guy could run for 14 or 1,500 yards this year if he can stay on the field. He's got that kind of talent. Wow. Good stuff there on Penny. And it might not be this year, but I do think Walker is going to be a star sooner than than later. I'm a big fan. And sticking with the draft – you kind of slipped this in last segment, you know, they doubled down on tackles. They doubled, they doubled down on pass protecting tackles, edge pass rushers and corners. Like all of it, do they realize that, you know, are they catching up to the analytic world? Like what the heck's going on in Seattle? They're not taking running backs and linebackers in the first round anymore. Well, there were still some fans that were upset about a running back in the second round, but with Chris <laughs> Carson's situation and a player of that talent, I think it was a very solid value pick personally, but I think it paves the way for the next quarterback too, you know, Matt, I think they stopped out thinking themselves Mm -hmm. because I think that that has been a major problem for this organization for the last five or six years where they've tried to be the smartest guys in the room. And as a result, they ended up not making some of the smartest decisions in terms of the players that they were bringing in. And so I think that he's looked at pick number nine, for example, Charles Cross, we need a tackle. He's the best tackle here. He's got top 10 player talent, maybe not the prototypical fit for what we've looked at at left tackle in the past, but we got to catch up with modern times here. And this guy is a clear top 10 talent. Let's go get him. Abraham Lucas in the third round, pick 72. There were teams looking at him as a second round potential player. 
I I heard Seattle was looking at him at 41 when they picked Walker. So to get him at 72, again, they doubled down at a position of importance. Corner, you can never have too many good corners. And they go out and they get one that's pro-ready in Kobe Bryant, another one in Tariq Woolen that – there's real flash in the pan potential there. He might not pan out. He could be an all pro caliber player with the physical tools that he's got and the coach. I mean, who better to put him with than Pete Carroll, right? In the secondary. And then even their seventh round receivers, Bo Melton and Derek Young, they kind of went the same way there. Bo Melton's played a lot of snaps at Rutgers, didn't have a good quarterback, but there's clearly physical tools there, has played a lot of games in the Big Ten. And then Derek Young, a Division II guy. There has been like three players at the combine that posted the 40 time, the three cone and the vertical jump that he did at his pro day. It's 6'3", 224 pounds. Those are the type of freaks that if you can get them in the seventh round, you know, that guy could end up becoming a really good player in the league. He might not be anything more than a practice squad player, but I really liked the approach. And it was just it was such a detour from what we've seen right. in recent years from this front office. And props to the Seattle Seahawks for drafting the best of the NBA players in Kobe Bryant over Isaiah <laughs> Thomas and Chris Paul in this NFL draft. Um, okay, we got to talk NFC West real quick here. What are your thoughts on 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 the Seahawks going into 2022? Big picture versus their competition. And uh, I guess I could put it to you this way. How far behind the 49ers will the Seattle Seahawks finish in 2020? <laughs> Well, I think right now, clearly, they are the distant fourth team in this division. But I I'm going to put a big caveat to this because of what I said earlier. You look at the roster, and there is a lot of talent on this football team still. And I, met, I threw out a bunch of the names on both sides of the ball. If you can get a great season from Jamal Adams and he stays healthy, you get DK Metcalf re-signed, Tyler Lock Lockett, Noah Fant plays up to his potential. The two young tackles play as well as expected as rookies, and they improve as the season goes. Your run game plays the way that you think it will. This is not a team that is going to be a pushover. I, I don't believe this is a team that's going to go out and get blown out week in, week out, and get the number one pick. I think this is going to be a team that's going to lose a lot of close games because of the quarterback situation. If they had a little better quarterback, maybe that's Baker Mayfield. Who knows? Maybe some of those games turn into wins and suddenly they're looking at a borderline wild card situation. I think they have pieces in place on offense and defense to get there, but it's going to be tough sledding with the quarterback situation and the turnover they've got going on on both sides of the ball. And that's why they're doing that soft reload more than anything. Fantastic stuff. That is Corbin Smith. You got to read his piece on Chris Carson at SI, all the latest at Locked On Seahawks every single day. Find him on Twitter at Corbin Smith NFL. Corbin, pleasure chatting with you, and uh, I'll be talking to you a lot in the NFC West this season. Sounds good. Take care, guys. All right, fantastic stuff. Uh, thanks again to Corbin Smith for joining us on the show. We've got to talk a little bit more about this division, what we think about the Seahawks here, especially after getting some nice insight here from Corbin Smith. But first, we got to let the folks out there know about Bet Online, your number one source for all your sports betting stats and sports information. It's not just wagering. You get all kinds of news and sports information and the latest on all sports developments at betonline.net, including not only NFL futures, and there are a ton of NFL futures. You can bet on your sleeper team to win the Super Bowl or MVP, offensive, defensive, rookies of the year, or uh, different props for specific statistical milestones for players, passing yards for players, certain number of sacks, uh, tons of great NFL futures at Bet online, and of course, all of what's going on here currently on the sporting landscape. Bet on golf, multiple leagues in golf now, suddenly that you can bet on <laughs> NBA finals, obviously, NHL playoffs are happening, Major League Baseball all summer long, fighting news, MMA, UFC, boxing, even Vegas casino games at Bet Online, plus live betting, esports. And more bet online is your continued source for all of that sports wagering and information. So head over to bet online today. Use your desktop or mobile device to learn more about the trends and action at bet online where the game starts. Matt, what do you think about those Seattle Seahawks? And I thought Corbin put it really well that uh, it, just under Pete Carroll, it's not the type of team that might hit rock bottom. And of course, you know, they lost a quarterback, but I think they got better almost everywhere except for quarterback versus what they were last year, which, you know, means maybe they could keep their head above water. And I love the way he put it, that maybe they just lose some, a lot of close games rather than being a team that just can't win a football game and, and isn't competitive week to week. 
Yeah, and I think it's easy just to say they're terrible. They're gonna, be, you know, they're gonna be in the market for one of the early quarterbacks next year, and and that's possible. But I, I, you know, I mentioned some of these teams that know how to win in the league. Seattle absolutely is one of them, and I think those teams have a really difficult time ending up with a top five pick or whatever. And it, it's interesting. I love having the hosts on the on the from their teams because they're so dialed in with one team and they look at things differently and. There were a lot of guys I wanted to even talk to him further about, you know, that everyone kind of forgets about the players they added in the Russell Wilson trade. I mean, Shelby Harris is a really good player. He brought up Noah Fant a couple times. And and I'm sitting here staring at our our lad's roster, and he mentioned some guys that are building blocks. And I I think there's quite a few of them. You know, Quandry Diggs is one of the uh, best safeties no one ever talks about. And I agree that Jordan Brooks has a chance to be not the next Bobby Wagner, but a great second level leader and in, in player like that. Um, Darrell Taylor's a ga- guy he didn't bring up that is very impressive. Um, who is the other one? D Eskridge I wanted to talk about as well. Like some of these guys they've drafted recently pretty high that we haven't seen a lot of really in a good situation to break out. And, and we didn't mention Boye Mafe either. I think he's a really good prospect. I want to bring up some stats here that because uh, I remember Geno Smith actually had a, a decent run there when he yeah, was yeah. starting in place of the injured Russell Wilson, and he played four games last year. He started three of those games back to back to back weeks six, seven, and eight, and combined during weeks six, seven, and eight. One of those games was at the Pittsburgh Steelers, by the way. He played well in in week six. Yeah, he played well in those three games. Geno Smith completed 70.5% of his passes, threw for 571 yards, four touchdowns, and no interceptions. Had a quarterback rating of Mm 108.4. He played pretty darn good, right? If he does that all season long, then maybe they won't miss Russell Wilson that much. Now, I don't expect him to, to necessarily play like that all year long, but he's a veteran player. And he knows the offense. And I, I thought it was interesting how Corbin put it, that Drew Locke has to close the gap on Geno Smith. And I'm not even convinced he'll be able to do that. I, I don't either. I mean, the term point guard to me really stood out of who's not going to hurt the team. Well, that's Gino. I mean, Locke just hurts the team too much with bad decisions or risky throws downfield. I mean, he's not a point guard at all to me. And there are there is some ability there. I'm sure Seattle was high on him coming out of school. Fine. I mean, they're going to put a lot of time into him. But I think Gino is a professional quarterback. He has some limitations. And to your point, you know, four games is great or get you out of a game. If Russ goes down after, you know, you get exposed after a while, you know, when teams start to game plan for you week after week, but he's in a high quality backup all day long that gives them a chance to win and will keep things close. And if they can run the football pretty well, we'll see, you know, um, one thing I wanted to mention to Corbin too, and I don't hundred percent agree with it, but this morning, Pro Football Focus ranked the top 32 offensive lines, 1-32. to 32. They had Seattle 32. I mean, I thought that was a little harsh, but there's going to be growing pains there, you know. Well, even if, let's say, Abraham Lucas as a third-round pick turns into, you know, even a starting caliber player as a rookie, you still got another rookie at left tackle in Charles Cross. Damian Two rookie Williams. tackles. Third- Right. And yeah, right, right. like who's even competing with at, at the right tackle spot either? Uh, you know, you got Stone Forsyth, the six rounder from last year, Jake uh, Curhan, who I don't even know who he yeah, is. Yes, I'm not sure who he is. And he's top Undra- of the depth chart that I'm looking at. <laughs> yeah, an undrafted mm-hmm. guy. Right. Uh, in the past, um, you have Austin Blythe. You know, I, Gabe Jackson has been a good player. You know, he's he's up there mm-hmm. in age. And, and Damian Lewis, I guess you're you're feeling better about your guards. But, yeah, that, that could go very bad. And we've seen it takes tackle, even really good tackles in the NFL. Sometimes it takes them a little while. So, oh, yeah, I don't think you can even plug Charles Cross in. I mean, they're going to plug him in at left tackle. But you, you can't expect super high level just from week one, even if he does become a really good player. Now, he could be just awesome from the jump. But and he's got all kinds of athletic ability. But, you know, there's, there's going to be some growing pains there for that offensive line. So if you have quarterbacks, if you have starting QB 32 behind starting offensive line 32, <laughs> right, that is right. a terrible recipe. That is a bad recipe. I don't care who the coach is or who the good young talents are or if DK Metcalf's happy or not. I mean, that's right. just hard to win with that formula. And you even mentioned Gabe Jackson. You know, I mean, you would look at him and be like, well, at least I can count on Gabe Jackson at right guard. And, and I haven't studied him, but I just read the write-up from Pro Football Focus. They were very worried about him because every year, by their grading system, he's gone down and down and down. Like, he might be at the end, too. Like, ugh, you know, that's right. a little worrisome. Yeah, that, that is a frightening 
scenario. One thing I will say that I do like, I, I talked about Kenneth Walker and you mm -hmm. made some good points about how good Rashad Penny was in, in a small sample at the end of last year. And obviously he was a first round pick, so he's a super talented guy. Right. Um, but you know, I don't want to pay the price for that still. I'm going to, I'm going to take the running back too and hopefully get, you know, some, and you know, we've seen the injury history of, uh, of Penny as well. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm trying to find that value and look, and maybe Walker, his hype goes up and he's running back one. Then I will take Rashad, Rashad Penny as, as you know, running back two, if you're getting him at that. Whoever's level. cheaper. Huh? I want the, yeah, I want yeah, the yeah. cheaper. I want the running back two in that offense because I'm still not convinced Chris Carson, even plays will be a, a big part of that offense. Um, but how about this? I think I would buy low on DK Metcalf right now. There's so many yes. good receivers in the NFL. You can get a pretty good bargain on DK with no Russell Wilson. But those same three games that Geno Smith started last year, this is what DK Metcalf did in those three games, week six, seven, and eight. He had uh, he caught 14 of 18 targets for 197 yards and three touchdowns, including, I think, a, a deep bomb, a 48-yarder. No, it was, uh, I think he had like a 96. -yard. He had some big, long uh, reception touchdown uh, in, in one of those games, too. So I think Geno Smith can get the ball down the field a little bit, so DK mm -hmm. Metcalf might not suffer that much, and that might be what they're thinking on offense. Is like, look, we're going to run the ball a ton, and then we're going to go play action, and we've seen Geno Smith be able to um, to facilitate the ball to Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf in the past. Yep, and DK was a perfect fit with Russell as a deep ball receiver, of course, but by no means do I think Metcalf was a product of Wilson. You know, I mean, I mean throw Metcalf in any team, terrible quarterback, whatever, he's a star no matter what. He can stand alone star value. And, and a quick, walk, you know, Kenneth Walker nugget, and we brought this up before, um, in the dynasty world, he's he's the second rookie drafted in almost every draft I've seen. I mean, it goes Brees Hall, Kenneth Walker, and Penny's only signed a one-year deal. I would be really shocked if Carson's in the mix a year from now. So, you know, we'll see how this year goes, but I'm sure it'll be Walker's backfield starting next year. Yep, and as we know, there's a 100% chance of injury for running backs in the NFL. So no matter who yeah, starts, yeah. you know, even if Penny is the guy and is awesome for the first half of the year, what, what's the likelihood that that Walker isn't giving you a ton of value late in the season too, yeah. when you're in your fantasy playoffs you know, or vice versa. So if uh, they're yeah. cheap enough, I might want both. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Just yeah. buy the whole city. And the hope one gets hurt. You know, <laughs> yeah, the With fantasy football, there's so few, you know, just every down backs that you almost have to buy a committee by the, by, but, Again, if the offensive line's bad, what's that yards per carry going to look like for either? Right. With right. The a lot of questions for the Seattle Seahawks going into 2022 without Russell Wilson. We'll see how that turns out for him, but I do think that, yeah, it's it's all going to end up in a last place finish in a, in a pretty tough NFC West. No doubt. Yeah. All right. Thanks again to Corbin Smith for joining us here on the show. Thanks, everybody, for making Peacock and Williamson your first listen back tomorrow. Right here, Peacock and Williamson. Make sure you're subscribed, by the way, YouTube and yeah. all of your podcast platforms, but especially on the new YouTube channel. We are on the Locked On NFL channel on YouTube. Tons of other great content as well on the Locked On NFL channel. We appreciate you. Back tomorrow. Talk to you then.